Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's keynote presentation, Cannabis for Health Promotion and Disease Prevention. It is presented by Dr. Dustin Sulak, integrative osteopathic physician, the founder and medical director of Integrate Health and co-founder of Healer.com. My name is Judy O'Rourke, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want during the presentation. Simply click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email following the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're experiencing a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Sulak. I will now turn this presentation over to him. All right. Thank you for having me. I am feeling a lot of gratitude in this moment for the opportunity to get this information uh, into the hands of people who are interested in promoting health and preventing disease and interested in learning more about what cannabis has to offer us. So um, let's dig in. Here's an overview of what we'll cover during my talk it's um, cannabis for health promotion and disease prevention. We'll look at sleep, coronary artery disease, stroke, cancer, obesity, and diabetes. And then at the end of the presentation, I'll get into the nuts, of bolt, nuts and bolts of how I think people can use cannabis to promote health. And uh, then outside of cannabis, other dietary and lifestyle approaches to enhancing the activity of our endocannabinoid system because we can do that with cannabis, but we can do it with other interventions as well. Here are today's learning objectives. So number one is describe the rates of several public health outcomes such as diabetes and obesity in cannabis users versus non-users. Understand the preclinical findings on cannabinoids and in brain injury and heart disease and how this information may translate to real life scenarios and describe health promoting activities that can enhance the function of the endocannabinoid system. So let's take a moment to consider why prevention? Why is prevention an important topic in the world of cannabis and in the world of healthcare in general? So as a clinician, I've been practicing for about 10 years and generally attracting patients who have failed to respond to conventional treatments from all walks of life and many different areas of medicine. I see patients with cancer, neurologic conditions, infectious conditions, psychiatric conditions, and they typically come to me after nothing else has worked. And impressively, and I don't take credit for this, I uh, uh, mostly credit uh, cannabis because it's such a safe and effective medicine, but I get great results with some of the toughest patients in medicine. And so, I started thinking, if I can get such good results with some of the toughest cases, could I use a similar intervention in a different way to prevent disease? Could I, would it be possible to keep people healthy and not have to go through all the work of getting sick and then trying to uh, work our way back to health? And of course, that process of cycling through uh, illness and wellness is very important for all of us. Uh, to go through in our lives that makes us stronger and wiser and more fit. But at the same time, I believe that in uh, conventional medicine, uh, the concept of prevention is uh, heavily underutilized. Um, basically, we control people's cholesterol and give them vaccines uh, to interventions that I think are um, not the full picture of prevention. So let's talk a little bit about how um, I believe that cannabis can prevent disease and promote health and some of the data that supports this. And we'll begin with a really uh, foundation of good health and that's sleep. 
But before I get to sleep, um, just a, a quick note about chronic disease. This is data from the CDC. So half of all adults in the United States have one or more chronic health condition. And seven of the 10 top causes of death are chronic diseases. Arthritis is the leading cause of disability. And 86% of all healthcare spending is for people with chronic disease. So imagine if we could chip away at this chronic disease, if we could not only manage it, but if we could prevent it, what kind of resources that would free up and how much improvement in quality of life and prevention of suffering we could accomplish. So let's talk about sleep. This is my son, Sam, who's a great sleeper. And so often you hear people say, oh, I slept like a baby. And for my first two children, I didn't really uh, understand that saying because babies don't often sleep that well. But Sam is a champion sleeper, as you can see from this photo. So how does sleep relate to chronic disease? Basically, I could take a very healthy person and disturb their sleep for a month, and they'd come down with a number of symptoms, probably pain and lack of concentration or focus, and mood swings, and, and all sorts of other things. Sleep is, is so important. Now, this data from 2013 uh, shows what the rates are of some common conditions related to the number of nights per month that someone's getting adequate sleep, restorative sleep, or insufficient sleep. And as you can see here on the top left, um, for people that are sleeping poorly, half the nights or more, so 14 to 30 days uh, per month with poor sleep, they have a significant increased rate in diabetes, basically either 35% more or 65% more likely to have diabetes. Also for people that are poor sleepers, they have much higher levels of coronary artery disease. So 58% more coronary artery disease uh, for people that are sleeping poorly 14 to 29 nights per month. And for people that never sleep well, more than double the rate of coronary artery disease. We see similar numbers with stroke, about 31% more stroke in people with poor sleep more than half the nights. And for people that sleep poorly every night, more than double the rate of stroke. And same for arthritis, but even for people that sleep poorly one to 13 nights per month, they have a 26% increase uh, rate of arthritis. And then as you can see, as sleep gets worse, the rate of arthritis just goes up and up. Now, all of these associations were still present after adjusting for age, sex, race, education, frequent mental distress, and obesity. So these researchers were really able to hone in and, and show that regardless of all these other factors, sleep is a risk factor for developing all of these conditions and more. Non-restorative sleep is a strong independent predictor of new onset widespread pain. And people that have non-restorative sleep more than half the nights are much more likely to have widespread pain. And also sleep changes how we respond to pain medications. It counteracts the analgesic effects of opioid drugs and serotonergic drugs. So these would be uh, narcotic uh, pain relievers and antidepressants that can also help with pain. And it produces hyperalgesic changes. So poor sleep makes us more sensitive to pain. That's what hyperalgesic changes means. Now, if we look at a report from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and, Health, um, and Medicine, from the Health and Medicine Division in 2017, they did a very comprehensive review on the data of around medical cannabis and adult use or recreational or illicit use cannabis. And I'm just gonna show you a few of the summary uh, conclusions that they came up with. Uh, first of all, they found conclusive or substantial evidence that cannabis or the compounds found in cannabis are effective for the treatment of chronic pain in adults, for the treatment of chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, and for improving multiple sclerosis spasticity as, um, as, as reported by the patient. They also found moderate evidence that cannabis can be effective in improving sleep outcomes in people with sleep disturbance associated with a variety of conditions, sleep apnea, fibromyalgia, chronic pain, 
and multiple sclerosis. So I'm showing this to demonstrate that we already have a good amount of data that cannabis is an effective treatment for sleep disturbance. And it's not because cannabis is a hypnotic. It doesn't just knock people out and make them fall asleep. What it ends up doing is mitigating the symptoms that are disturbing sleep in the first place. So this might be anxiety, this might be pain or depression or racing mental activity, uh, inability to remain still, restless limbs, and so forth. Uh, there's lots of reasons why people have disturbed sleep, and it seems like uh, cannabis is able to help quite a few of them. So what are my strategies for treating sleep disturbance with cannabis? Well, um, we can think about sleep disturbance in kind of two parts. There's the onset of sleep, so how fast does one fall asleep at night? Or is, is a person lying there awake for two hours before they fall asleep? And then there's sleep maintenance. So once a person falls asleep, are they waking up every hour tossing and turning, or do they stay asleep until morning? For sleep onset, typically the best strategy with cannabis that I found is uh, the inhaled route. And so that could be vaporization or smoke if that's what somebody prefers. And of course, uh, using the right type of cannabis. So chemovar selection is very important. Some types of cannabis will be very awakening and others will be more sedating. So choosing a sedating terpene profile or sedating chemovar is important. Now for people that need help staying asleep, inhalation is not the best route because it typically wears off after a few hours. And so you would want something with a longer duration of action and that's why oral delivery is going to be the best. So taking a tincture, an oil, or a capsule would be best. I, I don't recommend edibles. I don't think it's a, a good idea to eat right before bed. Uh, while we sleep is a good time for our digestive tract to also stop digesting and to start repairing and regenerating. So I like to uh, allow it to do that while we sleep and avoid the edible. Now, CBD is interesting. It's associated with increased wakefulness and increased total sleep time with less frequent arousals. That might seem a little contradictory. And uh, based on my clinical experience, I believe I've found that about five or 10% of my patients who try using CBD in the night before bed, uh, it actually keeps them awake. Most people find that CBD makes them feel awake but when they lay down and close their eyes, they're able to fall asleep no problem. Uh, and that 10% uh, is uh, really just a, a guess, but I, I think that's about what I'm seeing. Also, it's important to use cannabis as a part of a healthy sleep hygiene routine. So if one is using cannabis intentionally, they can be dimming the lights, uh, they can be avoiding screens, uh, and uh, all the other aspects of sleep hygiene. Cannabis goes along with those as well. Now, in my clinical practice, I've seen cannabis work for many conditions, but I believe that the symptom that I've seen cannabis most effective for, most consistently effective for, is suppressing the recall of nightmares in people with post-traumatic stress disorder. Almost everyone with PTSD who I've ever seen that has sleep disturbed by nightmares, who ends up getting the right dose of oral cannabis before bed, reports significant improvement or complete improvement in their symptoms. And this is just a trial from 2009 that used a synthetic cannabinoid, Navalone, and proved basically that 60% uh, of the patients uh, had a total cessation of their nightmares, another 13% had a satisfactory reduction. So that was about 73% total responded to the synthetic cannabinoid, and their dose remained stable over four to 12 months, so there wasn't dose escalation. Uh, so very effective, and I think that herbal cannabis can be more effective than a synthetic cannabinoid. Now moving on from sleep to some of the other conditions that we saw sleep disturbance associated with, like heart disease and stroke. So these are the leading causes of death in the United States. And you can just see how much heart disease there are and uh, there, there is in our country, as well as cancer. And we'll talk about cancer a little bit later in the talk. But let's start with heart disease, the leading cause of death. So a great uh, review article, uh, very concise from Dr. Ethan Russo from 2015. Uh, first of all, looked at the risks of cannabinoids and cardiovascular disease. Can cannabis make cardiovascular disease worse? And what do we need to know about it, uh, about using cannabis for people that already have cardiovascular disease? Is it safe for them to use cannabis? So stimulating the CB1 receptor, particularly in someone who's new to cannabis, can increase heart rate, 
and increased blood pressure or decreased blood pressure. At low doses, THC usually stimulates the sympathetic or the fight or flight nervous system and inhibits the parasympathetic, also known as the rest and digest nervous system. At high doses, we sometimes see the opposite effect, which can lead to orthostatic hypotension. Basically, blood pressure goes down and someone gets dizzy after they stand up, as well as bradycardia, slow heart rate. The acute effects of THC, including intoxication and tachycardia, often diminish with chronic administration. So people that are used to cannabis have much less pronounced cardiovascular side effects. People that are new to cannabis may get a little bit of a racing heart, may get a little bit of a low blood pressure. For most people, this isn't going to be a big deal. But if someone has very severe heart disease, say to the extent where they wouldn't be able to safely walk up a flight of stairs, it also might not be safe for them to use cannabis or it would only be safe for them to use cannabis with very precise, careful dosing under medical supervision. Now, CBD is an anti-inflammatory antioxidant that tends to counter the anxiety and tachycardia side effects of THC. That means tachycardia is racing heart. And it also appears to be broadly cardioprotective, which is a, a good reason to combine CBD with THC in people that have cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular side effects with cannabis are much more common with inhaled delivery, like especially with very potent forms of inhalation, smoking hash or dabs. Uh, in formal studies of therapeutic administration of nabiximols, which is an oral spray that contains equal parts CBD and THC roughly, uh, cardiovascular adverse events were seen occasionally in the early studies that had very high dosing, up to 130 milligrams of THC per day. But then the nabiximols trials changed their titration schedule and made it a lot lower and slower dosage, slower to increase the dosage. And when they did that, the cardiovascular side effects became extremely rare, less than 2% incidence of tachycardia, hypertension, and orthostatic hypotension. So the dose really makes a difference, and so does the delivery route. Inhaled cannabis kicks in so quickly all at once that you're more likely to get these cardiovascular side effects Oral cannabis does not. It kicks in in a nice, gradual manner. And, um, and there's been, it's been shown that there's no QT uh, interval changes related to that treatment. Now, we've uh, just covered the risks of using cannabis in people with heart disease or cardiovascular disease. What about the potential benefits? So what this diagram explains is what we know about how stimulating the CB2 receptor can have a protective or a healing effect in two situations, heart attack and stroke, which are similar uh, types of conditions. Uh, something happens that occludes or blocks the blood supply to a very important tissue like the heart muscle or the brain, and that ends up causing damage. And that damage is mediated by immune cells and by inflammation. And as you can see on the slide here, there's multiple mechanisms of action by which the CB2 receptor are, is able to decrease the amount of damage caused by these injuries. And it does that by acting on vascular smooth muscle, on the endothelial cells, on the neutrophils. This is one of the beautiful things about the endocannabinoid system is we see it all over the body. All of these different cell types express the CB2 receptor. And when we stimulate that CB2 receptor with THC, for example, then we're able to uh, achieve these benefits, at least in preclinical models. So here's an example of a, a rodent study uh, where mice were, uh, uh, these are mice that uh, produce atherosclerotic lesions, hardening of the arteries and buildups of plaque. And uh, basically after five weeks, they were given oral THC at a very modest dose, one milligram per kilogram per day. And uh, you can see on the picture, how the vehicle group that did not receive the THC, the size of their lesions of their of the plaques inside the arteries grew quite a bit, whereas the THC group only grew a little bit over those next six weeks. And so you can see quite a difference there. Now, these researchers also administered a CB2 blocker, and that did, and when they administered THC with the blocker, there was no benefit. So that shows that THC was likely working via the CB2 receptor. Another extremely interesting study from 2013, also in mice, showed that administering a tiny, tiny dose of THC two hours before inducing a heart attack 
protected the heart and sped the recovery. So the mice that got this tiny dose of THC had better fractional shortening. That means how well their heart was able to contract after the injury. They had less troponin leakage. Troponin is a uh, something that the damaged heart cells will leak out, and it's a way of measuring the damage. They had smaller infarct size, so the dead cells were uh, there were less of them. It was a smaller area and less accumulation of neutrophils to the infarct area, meaning less immune activity, less inflammation there. So it's just amazing that this tiny dose of THC could do such a thing. And now I hope that most of you, when you're watching this, are wondering. Well, what about me? If I have a little bit of THC in my system, because this study in mice showed that all you need is a tiny bit, if I have a little in my system, could that protect me from a heart attack? And I believe that we're, we have some data now that suggests the answer is yes. So this study from 2016 reviewed hospital records of over a million patients in eight states. And almost 4,000 of them just self-reported cannabis use on admission. Now, if you look at all of the ones that had a, a heart attack and you split them into those that admitted to using cannabis and those that said they don't use cannabis and then control for some other factors, like everyone in the study was under 70 years of age, did not use alcohol, co cocaine or methamphetamines and so forth. And when we adjusted for some of these other factors or when the researchers did, what they found was that on the left side of the graph, we have the cannabis users, the right side, we have the non-cannabis, um, oh, excuse me, on the left side of the graph, we have cannabis users demonstrating a lower risk, and on the right side of the graph, demonstrating a higher risk. And so you can see here that the cannabis users had a lower overall, overall risk of death. So this means out of all these people that had a heart attack, if they were a cannabis user, they were less likely to die. They were less likely to need an intervention that's like a balloon, that's the IABP. They were less likely to go into shock, and they were less likely to need another trans, uh, transcutaneous uh, intervention. So less interventions and less death. The only thing that was worse in the cannabis using group was a higher likelihood of needing a ventilator, which probably is because most of these cannabis users were smoking it, and maybe that smoke was irritating their lungs or causing bronchitis or something like that. Another similar study uh, that looked at about three and a half thousand patients uh, in each, so about 7,000 patients total that were hospitalized for heart failure and divided into cannabis users and non-cannabis users. This study found that among the heart failure patients, the cannabis users were much less likely to develop a cardiac arrhythmia called atrial fibrillation. And, uh, and you can see it was about um, uh, 80 adjusted odds ratio was 0 0.87, so this means about 13% uh, uh, lower likelihood of having atrial fibrillation in the cannabis users compared to the non-users. Now, heart attack and stroke are similar conditions. Stroke is also very common, one out of every 20 deaths in the US, so that's on average every four minutes someone's dying of a stroke. Uh, stroke costs the United States an estimated $34 billion each year, and currently there are no approved neuroprotective agents. So what do I mean that, by that? Well, when someone has a stroke, when there's an area of the brain that dies because the blood supply is disturbed, there is a release of contents from the dead cells. And some of those contents become toxic to the surrounding cells, especially something called glutamate, which creates an excitotoxicity. And then we see the surrounding cells starting to get sick and die. They start releasing their contents and we get this domino effect that's called the stroke penumbra. And we know that after someone has a stroke, in the next 48 to 72 hours, the size of the damage is going to grow and grow and grow. And basically, we just sit there and watch it happen because we don't have any approved agents that can stop that spread of damage. And you can see on the image uh, on the left how the ischemic core in red will eventually spread uh, to the yellow area and then to the green area. So uh, what can we do? You know, time is brain, some people say, um, but that's, well, they actually say it more with um, with a uh, heart attack because we do have interventions that can help. And so time can be muscle. The faster we get that clot out of there, um, the better uh, someone is, more likely someone is to recover. But we're not we're not doing that very well with stroke because we don't have a neuroprotective agent. But what about cannabinoids? 
Well, uh, we know from a lot of animal research that first of all, our brain will make more cannabinoids when it's injured. Anandamide and 2-AG are endogenous neuroprotective agents produced by the nervous system when it's exposed to both chemical and mechanical trauma. And we know that these agents, along with THC, CBD, and synthetic cannabinoids, can all decrease glutamate excitotoxicity, which can not only reduce seizure activity, but limit the size of the infarct after a stroke. This is well known, and it has been for a long time, to the extent that our United States Department of Health and Human Services, our federal government, owns a patent on the use of cannabinoids as antioxidants and neuroprotective agents. And we can see in this patent uh, that there is a summary of the literature suggesting that these compounds may be just the thing people should receive when they have a stroke. And we have explored and elucidated many of the mechanisms by how cannabis could protect against stroke. And there's it's more than just CB2, which I showed you on an earlier slide. CB1 receptors are involved in protecting against glutamate toxicity and preventing the excessive release of glutamate. Uh, CB2 receptors we already talked about. The cannabinoids themselves are antioxidants and can decrease reactive oxygen species. CBD works on the 5-HT1A serotonin receptor, which can improve vascular supply and, uh, and um, make it so the tissue is less likely to die from starvation of oxygen. And then we have unknown targets uh, as well that, that are still being explored. So many mechanisms for how cannabinoids could potentially help people with stroke. Now there's a huge amount of animal data that shows that cannabinoids are protective in experimental models of stroke. And as you can see on the slide here, uh, whether it's endocannabinoids that are tested, THC or CBD, there's been numerous experiments and all of them show that the volume of the lesion is much smaller when the animals receive injections of these compounds. Any cannabinoid, whether it's synthetic, endocannabinoid, meaning one that the body produces, or a phytocannabinoid like those found in the plant cannabis, have been associated with less early motor impairment, so less damage that causes movement disorder, less late motor impairment, and improved survival. And it's not just a little improved survival, it's more than double the survival in the animals that receive the cannabinoids on average. And this was a review article from 2014 of all of this data. Does this data translate to humans? Well, yes, it does, actually. We have some observational evidence, not controlled clinical trials, but some suggestive evidence that people who have brain injury that have cannabis in their system are less likely to die. So this was a study from 2014 that looked at 440 people with traumatic brain injury. Their overall death rate was 9.9%. When we divide them into people with THC in their system or people without THC in their system, you can see on the slide that the people with THC were only 2.4%, uh, only 2.4% of them died, whereas 11.5% of the THC negative group died. So again, it appears that cannabis is having a protective effect. At least it's associated with less death. Another study from 2016 on 725 adult patients with spontaneous brain bleeds, again, showed that cannabis positive, number one, was much more likely to have no symptoms. So if you look at the, at the, uh, the top line on the bar graph, is uh, cannabinoid positive and the bottom is cannabinoid negative. And so you can see 19% of the cannabis group, cannabis users had no symptoms after their brain bleed, while only 3% of the non-cannabis group was symptom free. And you can see that whole shift to the right on the cannabis group all the way to death. 26% of the cannabis group died while 33% of the non-cannabis group died. There's also a significant amount of research uh, using CBD to protect against perinatal brain injury. So this would be lack of oxygen due to birthing. And uh, in newborn rats and pigs, CBD has been shown to reduce the death of the neurons and the astrocytes, which are like immune cells in the brain, to preserve brain activity, prevent increased biomarkers of brain damage, prevent the appearance of seizures, and improve the performance, neurobehavioral performance, when examined 72 hours later and several weeks later. So this is likely very protective in that setting. 
Now let's change gears from heart attack and stroke to another leading cause of death and certainly of disability and suffering, cancer. Uh, here are the uh, types of cancer that are most common in the United States. We have 230,000 new cases of breast cancer every year and 40 women die of it every year. And you can see the rest of the statistics. It looks like people are dying more of lung cancer than other types of cancer. Um, but our, our rates of cancer are so high for a number of factors we don't have time to discuss in this presentation. But basically for someone living in the United States, if you're a man, your risk of developing a non-skin cancer, so an invasive cancer, is about one in two in your lifetime. And your risk of dying from a cancer is about one in four. If you're a woman, it's a little bit better. Your risk of developing an invasive cancer is one in three, and your risk of dying from it is one in five. But cancer is a big deal. And so if we're talking about preventing disease, this is one that I think we should talk about preventing. Uh, and, and so same with stroke and same with heart disease. And again, I wanna circle back to some of where we started today, which is sleep, because I think sleep has an impact on everything that we talk about in today's lecture. So at one point I was very interested in finding the study that had the animals who had been exposed to the highest dose of cannabis or THC for the longest period of time to see how sick these animals could be from a huge dose. And so I found a national toxicology program report from 1996 where rats were given THC, either a placebo or just a vehicle a carrier, 12.5 uh, milligrams per kilogram, which is a pretty high dose, 25 milligrams per kilogram or 50 milligrams per kilogram, which is an extremely high dose uh, in corn oil uh, for two straight years. And the researchers said that survival of all dosed groups was generally significantly greater than the controls. This means that the 12 and a half, the 25 and the 50 milligram per kilogram group was more likely to survive than the placebo or the control group. The dosed animals had decreased incidence of mammary uh, fibroadenoma, so that's breast cancer, uterine polyps, pituitary adenoma, testicle adenoma, and pancreatic adenoma. These, these rodents getting huge doses of THC developed less cancer. There was no increased incidence of any cancer type in the dosed animals, and the animals that received the THC had a lower mean body weight. Seems like pretty good results at very high doses. There is some human evidence also that shows that people who smoke a lot of joints compared to people who don't use any cannabis do not have an increased rate of respiratory tract cancers. And that's probably surprising because smoking a lot of joints exposes one to numerous carcinogens, not the cannabinoids themselves, but the products of combustion like the tars and uh, other, other carcinogens that are in the smoke. So even though they're getting exposed to that smoke, they don't have any higher rate of cancers. And this data was non-significant, but it shows uh, maybe a little hint that the cannabis users have a lower rate of lung cancer, or there might be a trend in the direction of less lung cancer in the cannabis users, despite their exposure to so many carcinogens. Why? Probably because the cannabis is exerting an anti-cancer effect that balances out the effect of those carcinogens. Cannabis use was associated with a uh, much lower rate of bladder cancer in men. And this was a, a large study from 2015 from the California Men's Health uh, Database. Cannabis users had 45% less bladder cancer, while tobacco users had 52% more bladder cancer. And again, most of these cannabis users were probably smoking. And so cannabis is having some type of a protective effect here. I was also curious, and I scoured the literature for uh, possibilities of how cannabis could cause cancer. Is it possible? Because cannabis is so often a double-edged sword, like most things are. And if we use it appropriately, maybe it could be helping. And if inappropriately, maybe it could be hurting. And so I did find that there is an increased rate of testicular cancer in men who are cannabis users. Three studies have shown this, a total of 719 cases compared to uh, 1,400 controls. And what they found was that 
for people that were high frequency cannabis users, about a 56% increased rate of testicular cancer. And for people that were using cannabis for 10 years or more, about a 50% increased risk. And so testicular cancer generally occurs in young men, not always. And my assumption, even though the data didn't describe any of this, is that these are young men who are, are probably using cannabis for the purpose of getting high or experiencing euphoria and probably using a lot of it uh, very frequently. Now, numerous preclinical or animal studies have shown that cannabis has anti-cancer effects and these mechanisms of action have been elucidated. And if you look at this list on the slide, there's just so many types of cancers that have been shown to respond to cannabis more and more all the time. And uh, just like the stroke and the heart attack conversation, there's not a single mechanism of action. Cannabis is working to fight cancer in many ways, including triggering programmed cell death, and that's like an intelligent recycling of the cancer cell, um, increasing apoptosis and autophagy, which is like the cellular cleanup, suppressing tumor angiogenesis, which means preventing the blood vessels from growing that feed tumors, inhibiting the ability for the of the cancer to adhere to and migrate through tissue, which allows for metastasis throughout the body. And it's also important uh, to point out that the cannabinoids are able to do all of these things to help prevent and fight cancer without hurting healthy cells. And that's always the goal when it comes to cancer treatments. How can we harm the cancer without harming the individual? Now, we are all developing cancerous cells all the time. A cell that's supposed to die will have a problem in its cell cycle, a little mutation or a, a breakdown of the normal process that causes that cell to die. And it suddenly starts growing instead of dying and maybe multiplying. And then very quickly, our bodies have many mechanisms for identifying that and nipping it in the bud. It's when we fail to do so that eventually those cells will grow into a tumor and then um, eventually potentially grow into a cancer that spreads throughout the body. And so, what can we do to support our innate mechanism that's always at work, always trying to help us fight cancer that's constantly happening? Well, I think cannabinoids are a good choice because they're so safe for healthy cells. No one would wanna take chemotherapy uh, just for prevention uh, in hopes that they're not gonna get cancer. We, we couldn't do that because the side effects are way too severe. But something that's safe like cannabis, uh, that's part of an anti-cancer strategy. Here's just some examples of what we see in the literature. So on the left, we see the rate of growth of breast cancer uh, tumors. Basically, these are human cancer cell lines that are injected into rodents. And then the rodents are exposed to different conditions and researchers watch how fast those tumors grow. And so you can see the rate of growth uh, in the control group on the left. And then when you look at the group that received THC, their tumors still grew, but grew much more slowly. And then we see similar results with a synthetic cannabinoid that acts like THC. And another study that I uh, think is very interesting shows how cannabis, at least in this case, uh, with a certain chemotherapy agent called temozolomide in the setting of glioma, which is a type of brain cancer, cannabis is, uh, or THC is able to enhance the effects of temozolomide. So you can see the rate of growth over 15 days in the vehicle at the top of the slide the next line down is THC. So THC on its own did decrease the rate of growth of this cancer. Temozolomide decreased the rate of growth a little bit more. But look at that bottom line. Look at the combination of THC and this chemotherapy agent. It's just remarkable. And there's been subsequent studies that have looked at the combination of CBD and THC. And that study uh, showed that both are, are effective, uh, especially when combined at various ratios but interestingly, not CBD on its own. CBD plus temozolomide did not perform as well as CBD, excuse me, as, as temozolomide on its own, but that's just one animal study. So also besides enhancing the effects of chemotherapy, cannabis has been shown to enhance the effects of radiation therapy. And you can see, uh, again, the rate of the growth of this type of brain cancer glioma over 21 days on the top left, you can see the untreated animals. The top right, um, uh, treated with cannabinoids. And this was a combination of CBD and THC. The bottom left shows the radiation therapy. So none of those results were very impressive. 
But look at the bottom right, the combination of radiation and cannabinoids. Super impressive. There was almost no growth. And that's summarized in, uh, in section C on the right. And you can see how the radiation plus cannabinoids really outperformed all the other interventions. Now, we hear about cases of people with cancer that have decided not to use chemotherapy or radiation or any conventional treatment, and they decide just to use cannabis, sometimes very high-dose cannabis, and uh, sometimes they get great results. We actually only hear about the cases, typically, that get great results. All the cases where it doesn't work usually don't make it to uh, case reports and to the Internet. But here was um, one case published in O'Shaughnessy's Journal of Cannabis and Clinical Practice in 2013, uh, where we have an um, infant or a toddler, I believe, uh, I think two years old, um, that had uh, an invasive optic pathway glioma. It was non-operable. It wasn't likely that any radiation or chemotherapy would be successful in uh, killing the cancer. Uh, it might have just extended life a little bit, so the parents opted not to go that route. They took the baby home and started putting cannabis oil on its pacifier. And you can see from August 2011 to December 2012, the reduction in that big white mass in the middle of the brain. And it totally went away. And as far as I understand, uh, this uh, person is still alive today. There was a little human data that was released in a press release, but not in a publication yet. I expect it will be coming out at some point. But this was a placebo-controlled clinical study of a low to moderate dose of nabiximol, so that oral spray with CBD and THC, in people with a very aggressive brain tumor, glioblastoma multiforme. And um, the one-year survival rate in the nabiximol group was 83%, but in the control group was only 53%. So at one year, this was showing very promising results. And it's so well tolerated, and it helps with quality of life. It helps with mood and pain and sleep and all of this. Uh, it just makes so much sense for people with cancer, uh, especially this type of cancer, to be using it. But again, I'm talking about preventing cancer. So when you see results like this, that giving this low dose of cannabis along with conventional treatment can really increase the rate of survival in people that already have a cancer, what could it do in people that don't have a cancer, but might be at risk for one based on a variety of genetic and environmental factors. Let's turn the page and look at obesity and diabetes. So um, a really an alarming problem uh, in the United States, and very sadly, the United States has exported its dietary habits to the rest of the world. So you can see, I think the colors and pictures on the map uh, speak for themselves. But the rates of obesity have just increased drastically over the last 20 to 25 years. Diabetes, again, also increasing drastically. The medical cost of obesity in the United States in 2008 was $147 billion. The medical cost of diabetes, $176 billion. I'd like to put that number into perspective. So in 2008, the UN did a study about what it would cost to feed the entire nation, the entire world, excuse me. What would be the cost of preventing all famine and hunger? And the price tag they put on that was $30 billion per year. And they also said that if we did that for 10 years in a row, spent that much money on eradicating hunger, then we would have a sustainable infrastructure that would prevent hunger in the future. Now look at how much we're spending on disease associated with eating too much bad food, basically, eating the wrong food and eating too much of it. And, um, and what if we could just shift a little bit of that to helping all the people that are hungry and starving? I also like to put this into perspective uh, with the U.S. annual defense budget in 2015, it was $600 billion. What if we took some of that defense budget and made it one of our main missions to feed the people that are hungry? seems like that might actually help keep our world and our country safe um, and decrease crime and decrease all sorts of aberrant behavior. Uh, we spend a lot of money on things uh, other than fighting hunger. But actually, let's get back to the point. What about cannabis? So cannabis use has been associated in numerous large studies 
with a lower incidence of obesity. So for example, in one study, non-cannabis users had a 22% rate of obesity, cannabis users more than three times a week, a 14% rate of obesity. And you can see similar results from a subsequent study. And this has been, uh, this has been evaluated several times and it always looks around these numbers. Same thing with diabetes. Uh, people with recent use of cannabis were 40% less likely to be diabetic than non-users. None of these studies uh, determine causation. We can't say that the reason they're not developing diabetes is because they're using cannabis. Maybe the reason they're not developing diabetes is because they love dancing and they're very active. And that's the same reason they love using cannabis because they enjoy it more when they're dancing. I mean, who knows? There's many potential explain explanations. So we can't say that in humans, it's been proven that cannabis prevents diabetes and obesity, but we do have some very suggest some suggestive evidence from animal studies that it can do exactly that. So this was a mice study uh, in which uh, THC was administered to uh, two groups of mice, those that were fed a diet that's known to keep them lean and those fed a diet that's known to induce obesity. And what you can see uh, let's, we can look at the left column first. Uh, we have uh, the first row is body weight change, the second row fat mass change, and the third row daily energy intake. And you can see that in, on the left side, whether the mice got THC or whether they got a control didn't really make a difference. They all basically ended up the same. So basically in a diet that keeps mice lean, THC did not make them fat. It did not make them extra lean. It just really didn't do much at all. But if we look at the right side of this chart, in the dark and the top right, we can see the dark squares are the, the mice that were fed the obesity inducing diet and received THC. In the white squares, they did not receive THC. And look at the difference there in their body weight. Uh, moving down to, to letter D, look at the difference in their fat mass. And down at the bottom, the difference in their energy intake was pretty modest. So what's really interesting is that it wasn't necessarily that the THC fed mice were eating less. It looks like they were eating a little bit less, but not that much less, but their, uh, their fat and their body weight were much less. Really interesting. Now these researchers also took a look at the bacteria in the guts of these mice. And what they found was that the mice who did not receive THC that were fed the obesity diet, they had changes in their bacterial populations that we know are associated with obesity. The mice that received the THC, not only did they remain lean, they did not have those bacterial changes. So potentially one of the mechanisms of action is, in, is you know, not just acting on our metabolism, but also acting on the bacteria in the gut and promoting a healthy range of bacteria there. So we've covered a lot. We've covered sleep, heart attack and stroke, obesity, diabetes, cancer. Now, a lot of people are wondering, how do we put this into action? And I, and I just wanna um, bring some attention to the psychoactive effects of cannabis. Because when we're talking about preventative medicine, I believe that stress reduction needs to be an important focus. Like this has an implication on almost every disease state. And more and more as people are coming to cannabis, they want to experience the benefits of cannabis on their symptoms. They want to feel less pain. They want to sleep better. They want to um, uh, have less anxiety or better focus, more alertness, whatever it is. Those things are all great. And I still believe that one of the primary healing effects of cannabis has to do with its capacity to shift our consciousness, to change the way that we perceive and relate to our environment and i want to emphasize that because more and more i have patients that come to me and they say i want to use cannabis but i never want to get high can you do that for me doc and i say yeah we can do that and then on the follow-up visit you know i usually mention well you may you know this thing that you called getting high it's really not that intense and it may benefit you in some ways and this is what i tell them about you know first of all euphoria which is commonly reported as a side effect of cannabis is actually, in my opinion, typically a side benefit, especially when it's controllable and then happening at the right place at the right time. So what's euphoria? Positive mood, 
relaxation, laughter, more socializing, a distortion of time, which can be very helpful for people that are so caught up in the future and caught up in the past and missing out on the present moment, and the intensification of ordinary experiences. So things like eating, listening to music, watching TV or films, having sex, these things can become more enjoyable when one is experiencing the cannabis state of consciousness. Does that seem like a bad thing? To me, that seems like it would just enhance quality of life and reduce stress. These are some of the other things that patients repeatedly tell me about when they finally do experience how cannabis can shift their consciousness. They describe an increased self-awareness, an unbundling of symptoms and suffering, and that's my term. Uh, but what people generally say is, uh, well, let me put it this way. Most people that are experiencing pain, say, they, they just come in and they say, this is hurting me, I'm having pain. And that's it. It's like one single experience. After using cannabis, people start to realize, oh, there's a sensation that I'm feeling. And then there's a part of me that judges that sensation as bad. And then there's a part of me that doesn't want to have that sensation anymore and gets anxious about it and is anxious all the time about it. And then there's the part of me that acts on that anxiety and that um, and that, that behavior then starts affecting my family and my relationships and so forth. And they're able to separate it all out, which is really helpful. That unbundling relieves suffering right there. And, and cannabis re uh, repeatedly does that for my patients. They say, well, the pain is less intense, but more, even more than that, it's, it's a different experience now. It's just more like a sensation, and I can leave it there. I don't have to get upset about it. I don't get anxious about it, and I don't have to let it bother me if I choose not to. Moving on, people frequently report that the cannabis state of consciousness uh, helps them feel a connection to something greater than themselves, whether it's the universe or God or nature. Uh, it helps them view oneself from a different vantage point. It fosters acceptance to things in life. I hear this all the time that uh, people finally accept their illness, accept their new chapter in life, or maybe they're disabled or have different abilities. Uh, it helps people find creative solutions to their problems, and it promotes flexibility, flexibility of the mind, emotional flexibility, literally physical flexibility, and capacity to change. So I think when people um, experience this, it can have a very healing effect, especially when it's at the right dose, and that would be the right dose of THC, in the right and supportive environment. Okay, so let's talk about ways that we can influence the endocannabinoid system without using cannabis. And then I'll bring it all back together and we can tie it up. Because a lot of what I'm talking about tonight, about using cannabis to prevent disease, is based on something that we're already doing. We all have an endocannabinoid system. We're all producing molecules that function a lot like THC for the purpose of preventing disease and responding to illness and injury in a way that prevents those problems from becoming chronic. Just like I told you about with the brain injury, right? When we get a brain injury, our brain starts making cannabinoids. It's doing that for a protective reason. And so adding some additional cannabinoids from the outside might make sense. So really everything we've talked about here has to do with the function of the endocannabinoid system. And cannabis is clearly not the only thing that affects that function. So let's talk about one dietary aspect, uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids. So these are fatty acids that are known as essential nutrients, meaning we don't make them in our body. We have to consume them in our diet and our body needs them as building blocks for signaling message uh, molecules. So um, omega-3 and omega-6 has been a hot topic for decades now, and rightfully so, it plays a large influence on our health. So an imbalance of omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is linked to several neurologic and neuropsychiatric disorders. Anandamide, our endocannabinoid, and 2-AG, another endocannabinoid, are derived directly from arachidonic acid, which is an omega-6 fatty acid. We have other endocannabinoids that are derived from omega-3 fatty acids. So these fatty acids are the building blocks of our endocannabinoids. If we don't have enough of them, it's going to be hard for us to build endocannabinoids at the right levels. Omega-3 supplementation or a diet rich in omega-3 
uh, is, has been shown to reduce physical pain significantly. Just a dietary intervention, or omega-3, less pain. And that less pain has been correlated to an increased level of two of the endocannabinoids that are produced from these omega-3 fatty acids. Now, DHEA in this setting is not the androgen hormone DHEA. This is actually uh, an endocannabinoid that has the abbreviation DHEA. Just wanted to clarify that. So in summary, dietary polyunsaturated fatty acid intake alters our endocannabinoid system. Omega-3 consumption can reduce anandamide and 2-AG levels that may actually be causing CD1 desensitization such as a case of obesity. And so I wanna, I wanna put this out there right now. A lot of times we get very black and white when we think about the endocannabinoid system, like, oh, more is better. More endocannabinoids equals better health. And of course, that's way too oversimplified. In certain areas of the body, more is better, in others, probably less is better, in certain physiologic conditions. So for example, people with obesity often have much higher levels of endocannabinoids to the extent that they're likely desensitizing their endocannabinoid system. It's just like when someone builds tolerance to THC, this is building tolerance to our own endocannabinoids and that dysregulates the system. And one of the ways to get the system back online is to actually gently block the endocannabinoid receptors, block the CD1 receptor. And we can do that with THC surprisingly because THC is a partial agonist which means in most settings, it's going to be stimulating the CD1 receptor. But when the, when the receptor is overstimulated already, THC can actually block it just a little bit and allow it to return to its normal function. That was a long tangent, but an important one. Omega-3 consumption can increase DHEA and 2-DG, which may have anti-pain and other benefits via the endocannabinoid system. How do I recommend people get this in their diet? And this plant also provides hemp seeds, a great source of both omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, along with uh, all the essential amino acids. It's really quite a complete food. I uh, highly recommend including hemp seeds in the diet. And then small cold water fish like sardines and uh, krill, which we typically don't eat, but our whales do. And for people that aren't just totally in love with sardines or other things like wild salmon, um, than uh, capsules full of krill oil or high-quality fish oil uh, could be a good solution for people that want to supplement their diet. Okay, let's talk about some other plants that affect the endocannabinoid system. Beta-caryophylline is a terpene that's found not only in cannabis, but also in black pepper, lemon balm, cloves, hops, and uh, quite a bit of it in an essential oil of a balsam tree from South America called copaiba. Beta-caryophylline has been shown to be a full agonist at the CB2 receptor, which provides anti-inflammatory, anti-scarring or anti-fibrotic, anti-itch, and other benefits. And remember, it was that CB2 receptor activity that protected, um, that was uh, part of the protective mechanism in stroke and in heart attack. So beta-caryophylline theoretically could be helpful in those settings. Echinacea is an herb with immune modulating effects. It's been used uh, for a long time. It contains alchemides that are also active at the CD2 receptor, as well as other targets, the PPAR gamma receptor, which is a nuclear transcription receptor, as well as uh, partial or inverse agonist effects at the CD1 receptor. There's also a, a dietary sources of inhibitors of the FA enzyme. It's the fatty acid amide hydrolase enzyme. This is the enzyme that breaks down our endocannabinoid anandamide. And so if we inhibit the enzyme, we end up with higher levels of anandamide, which could be good in certain situations. And uh, these are all uh, foods that are considered uh, adaptogens, you know, healthy foods. So galango is a, a root. It's kind of like uh, ginger. It's found in some Thai food. Maca is another root um, thought of as... Uh, Tonic, and then aphrodisiac, and then uh, most of us are familiar with uh, chocolate, compounds that can inhibit uh, and increase the levels of endocannabinoids. I mentioned the beneficial bacteria in the gut earlier. Uh, probiotics and um, um, foods made via lacto-fermentation 
uh, have been shown to have a, a beneficial effect on the endocannabinoid system. So um, in human epithelial cells, exposing them to this one type of lactobacillus has been shown to increase the expression of the genes that uh, build this cannabinoid 2 receptor and also uh, decreased pain in rats. And that uh, decrease in pain was blocked by a CD2 receptor. So it looks like the probiotic lactobacillus acidophilus has something to do with our CD2 activity, at least in the gut, maybe elsewhere in the body. Now, a landmark article from 2014 from John McFarland called Care and Feeding of the Endocannabinoid System also covered many of the influences on our endocannabinoid system other than cannabis. Stress and social play are really big ones. So chronic stress impairs the endocannabinoid system via decreased levels of anandamide and 2-AG. Social play in rats increases CD1 phosphorylation, which is a marker of how active CD1 is, and the amygdala, and it enhanced anandamide levels in the amygdala and nucleus accumbens. So we probably don't need studies to tell us that play is a good thing and stress and uh, chronic stress, I should say, is a bad thing because most of us inherently like one and dislike the other. But it's another reminder of how we can affect our endocannabinoid system. These are basics of health. Whether we know that it's working via the endocannabinoid system or not, we know that less chronic stress and more play can be good things. Exercise, medium to high intensity voluntary exercise increases endocannabinoid signaling via increased serum anandamide levels and possibly increased CD1 receptor expression. Forced exercise did not increase anandamide levels and has been shown to decrease CD1 expression. Now these experiments are done in rodents and we can actually force the rodent to run on a wheel or we can allow it to run on a wheel voluntarily. And you can see that the same activity has a different effect based on whether it's voluntary or force. Now, I doubt that rodents are going to force themselves to exercise. But unfortunately, I think that people do. And so one of my take-home messages is that if you're exercising regularly, make sure that you enjoy it. Because if you hate it, your body's probably seeing it as a form of chronic stress, and it's probably not helping. So find something that you love. Now, uh, exercise has been shown acutely to increase anandamide levels, not just in animals, but also in humans. And so you can see on the chart here that uh, the levels of anandamide increase significantly uh, after 30 minutes of treadmill running. And the increase in anandamide was correlated with increased in improvement in mood. So those that had the best mood after exercise also had the highest level of anandamide after exercise. A lot of what we think about the runner's high, which we used to think was just an endorphin or our endogenous opioid system working, uh, is also uh, related to endocannabinoid production. Exercise high is absolutely in part mediated by endocannabinoids. Now, body work has also been shown to increase levels of endocannabinoids. And any of you that have had good body work, this study was osteopathic manipulation, but I expect that other types of body work do the same thing. Uh, after the treatment, there's quite a euphoric feeling. People often describe it as being floaty or giddy or just feeling super relaxed and calm and content. Um, those are the types of good feelings that we experience with increased levels of endocannabinoids. Um, and uh, osteopathic manipulation is, of course, one of my favorites uh, because I'm an osteopath. And this is a type of uh, treatment that I perform on most of my patients with excellent results. Endocannabinoid regulation in white and adipose brown tissue following thermogenic activation. Maybe these are terms that many of you haven't heard about. This is something that's actually become pretty big in my life. So we can think about all the different ways we can eat healthy to prevent disease. We can exercise. We can sleep. These are all very important. There's something in this world that we can use to promote health that we know a lot about but a lot of people don't use, and that is temperature or heat and cold energy. So thermal, thermal, uh, thermal therapy, we call it, where you know, being exposed to heat, maybe it's a sauna, a heating pad, uh, you know, a hot bath, hot tub, uh, also being exposed to cold, maybe it's an ice pack after an injury 
or maybe it's an ice bath or a cold shower outside in the winter. Uh, these are all things that can really affect our physiology and at the right dose promote uh, market improvements in health. And so, for example, winter swimmers have less cardiovascular disease and less colds and flus. People that use sauna three times a day or more have uh, longer lifespans, less cancer, less cardiovascular disease. The exposure to these uh, temperature extremes can be quite healthy when done correctly. So this was an animal study from 2016 that showed that exposure to cold caused an upregulation of endocannabinoid levels and the biosynthetic enzymes that produce endocannabinoids in white adipose tissue. White adipose tissue is our normal body fat. Well, what we think of as normal. It's what most people have for fat tissue. It's white, and the reason it's white and not brown is because it doesn't have mitochondria in it, or not many. Mitochondria are the energy production machines that live inside the cell. And it's the same reason that when you eat chicken meat, or when someone eats chicken meat, there's white meat and dark meat. The dark meat is dark because it's full of mitochondria. And we find it in the legs because chickens are using those muscles all the time. They're having to run, and so therefore, uh, those muscles require a lot of energy production, whereas the white meat doesn't require as much. They're not flying. Uh, and so activation of brown adipose tissue and the browning of the white adipose tissue in mice causes upregulation of endocannabinoid levels and presumably endocannabinoid signaling via the CB1 receptor. And I just have to give a shout out to Wim Hof, the so-called ice man. If we always choose comfort, we never learn the deepest capabilities of our mind or body. Uh, Wim Hof is a Dutch world record holder that's developed an incredible technique uh, that combines many types of stress and allows one to uh, more comfortably experience cold exposure and uh, achieve its health benefits. He teaches his technique free online. There's a free app, and I, I practice it almost every day. It's, uh, it's brought a huge amount of benefits to my life, and so I encourage people to check it out uh, as a way to stay healthy and also as a treatment for pain and for depression. And moving on from cold exposure, another one of my favorites that a lot of people don't necessarily like right at the beginning is fasting. Fasting has been shown to increase levels of anandamide and 2-AG in certain areas of the brain. Um, and that uh, hypothalamic 2-AG declines as animals eat. So when we're in a fasted state, we're making more endocannabinoids. And fasting, again, has numerous health benefits. It's totally free, or we could think of it as the opposite of expensive because it saves people money. Uh, it's something any of us can do anytime with a little research and uh, guidance or supervision. Uh, this fasting can be an extremely safe, effective way to promote health. And we know that just one of the ways that you might promote health is via the endocannabinoid system. So let's wrap it up. In summary, my recommendations for endocannabinoid system enhancing activities, omega-3 fatty acids like hemp seeds, sardines, and so forth, beta caryophylline, black pepper, lemon balm, cloves, also found in cannabis, inhibiting the fat enzyme by consuming chocolate, maca, or galangal, eating fermented foods, numerous benefits there, uh, reducing stress, improving social play, enjoying the exercise that you're doing daily or almost every day, uh, checking out manual medicine like osteopathic treatment as well as energy medicine, uh, ice bathing in particular if you prepare yourself using the Wim Hof method, uh, and fasting. Now that's all the things beyond cannabis that we can do to enhance our endocannabinoid system. The next question is what can we do to use cannabis to prevent disease and promote health? And these are some of my recommendations. Number one, use cannabis in a way that avoids tolerance building. If you've built tolerance to cannabis, then you've also built tolerance to your endocannabinoids and you've downregulated your endocannabinoid system. So always use the lowest effective dose to achieve your goal. Now, what are your goals? Well, your goal should be, number one, excellent restorative sleep. If you're not getting great sleep on a regular basis, you're at risk for all of these diseases. So use cannabis to promote restorative sleep in the ways that we've described. We already went through that. How else could I use cannabis to prevent disease and promote health? Improve 
uh, social play, get creative, have fun more often, and reduce stress. And I think cannabis can absolutely do that at a low dose. You don't have to be stoned. You don't have to be hallucinating. Just a little bit can go a long way, especially in the right environment with the right expectation. Uh, use cannabis to promote physical activity. A lot of people find that just a little bit of cannabis before yoga, before going for a run, before any type of exercise. Another one of my favorites is bouncing around on a mini trampoline. It's extremely fun. Put on a few songs and you get a great workout. Cannabis can enhance the enjoyment and take people deeper into their practice of exercise, as well as other practices like meditation and prayer. And we didn't cover that in today's uh, talk, but things like gratitude, just counting our blessings, spending time meditating, being mindful, or connecting to whatever we consider a higher power, all of those things are associated with reduced stress and less chronic disease. Finally, someone might ask, well, how can I use cannabis in a way where it's not going to cause like a different feeling in me, but might still act as a tonic to keep me healthy? One of my favorite ways to do that is to consume the raw cannabis. Uh, and probably the best way to do so is cannabis tea. So you can literally just take a pea-sized piece of a raw cannabis flower, can be dry, and you can pour hot water over it and let it steep for five minutes and drink the tea. And if you're willing, eat that little bit of flour that's left in the cup that's going to have very low levels of THC in it. Most of the cannabinoids that are present will be THCA and CBDA. The A stands for acid, and the acid form is the raw form of the cannabis. And when the cannabis gets heated, this THCA turns into THC, the CBDA turns into CBD, and so forth. So when you drink cannabis tea, yes, you will get a little THC. If it's the right chemovar of cannabis, you get a little CBD. But mostly you'll be getting acidic cannabinoids, which have powerful anti-inflammatory properties. And I don't want to discount these tiny amounts of THC. As you saw, a super small amount of THC was enough to prevent the damage, some of the damage of a heart attack in that mouse model. So that summarizes how I recommend to use cannabis to promote health and to prevent disease. And of course, when it comes to my uh, interactions with an individual one-on-one, -on -one, I really uh, do my best to identify what are their weak spots in their um, in their health promotion and disease prevention uh, strategies and how can we use cannabis to specifically target that. And I think all of you could ask yourselves the same questions and probably get some good answers. I hope that this was helpful for you. Thank you so much. Please feel free to check out healer.com. It's my patient education website. It's free. A lot of this information, a lot of other information about how to use cannabis safely and effectively without side effects. You can find it all there on healer.com. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Sulak, for that informative presentation. I would also like to thank Lab Roots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that this webcast will be available for on-demand viewing from June 28th, 2019. As a final reminder, our speaker will follow up with any questions you've submitted via email. Dr. Sulak will do his best to answer questions in a timely manner, always trying to triage more urgent patient care demands from his practice. Attendees who feel like they would benefit from more education and would like to schedule one-on-one -on -one time speaking with Dr. Sulak can schedule an appointment through his office. Just log on to healer.com to do so. That is all for now. Thank you for joining us. We will see you next time. Goodbye.